Hey, what is up guys, Man 4 here, and today I'm going to be discussing the penultimate episode of Series 11, It Takes You Away. It Takes You Away is our final episode this season to be written by a guest writer, this time Ed Hein, and uh, it's definitely an interesting one. It's a very different kind of Doctor Who episode. Uh, it's very strange, and actually, um, on both my watches, I had some conflicting feelings about it, actually, but um, overall I did grow to appreciate it more, I think, on a second watch, but it, it definitely has a lot of elements that are somewhat jarring on a first watch, and I, I feel like this is definitely one of those episodes that should be watched again. Not necessarily every episode needs to be watched a second time, but this one, I, I feel like it needs time to sink in and actually watch it again to be able to appreciate it a little bit more just because of some of the absurdity that it has in it. But it starts out like a normal Doctor Who episode. The TARDIS crew uh, has already landed. They're in this beautiful forest uh, in Norway. I'm not sure where they actually filmed it, but the episode is set in Norway. And the location footage that they have is just, oh, it's gorgeous. Fantastic job picking that location. I do wish we got to spend a little bit more time here, um, because the episode takes a turn partway through, and it kind of like I mentioned, it's a very different episode from what it seems like at first. Um, so we don't really get to see much of this scenery, but for what little it is there, uh, it's, it's really, really nice. Right off the bat, um, Whitaker's Doctor is written a little bit more goofier. I'm not sure if this is, um, the result of Ed Heim's writing or some rewriting by Chris Chibnall. A lot of the rest of the episode, though, I suspect this, this was Chibnall's doing near the beginning because a lot of the rest of the episode, 13 isn't as much like her lighthearted childlike self that she has been a lot of the rest of the season, um, which I'm going to discuss a little bit later. But sort of because of that, even right away actually, some of the things she says feel kind of out of place, uh, like she eats some of the dirt to try and determine where they are and what's around them, which it, it, that's a very Tennant and Smith Doctor thing to do. Uh, but she also makes a mention about a woolly rebellion, because she sees a sheep, and then she goes on about it for a few sentences, and I don't know, that kind of thing, it just, uh, it seemed like a really poorly executed joke to me because you just need to say the Wooly Rebellion, you don't need to go on about it, then, then it just starts to sound ridiculous and it just doesn't feel right. But thankfully this is done away with pretty quick as they spot uh, a cabin some ways away and decide to go and investigate it and they find it all boarded up and protected as if it's almost abandoned and uh, they end up realizing that what and they end up deciding to investigate it. And here, it, it, this gives a very creepy atmosphere inside the cabin as they first go inside. Uh, we know that there's someone in there, we see a brief glimpse of them looking out the window, and um, there's a little bit of suspense as they start searching through the cabin until they eventually find this girl, Hannah. Uh, she's a blind woman, uh, a young woman. Uh, the episode calls her a kid, but she doesn't, she doesn't really look like a kid. I guess she kind of acts like someone in there uh, early teens, but she definitely looks older than that. I'm not sure how old the actress was, but I did find it kind of funny because a couple of times um, Ryan refers to her as a kid, and Ryan's supposed to be 19 years old, and to me they look almost the same age. So, I, I don't know, I just thought that was kind of interesting. What this episode also does is promise us a monster. Uh, apparently it's all boarded up because there's a monster in the woods, and it's taken away Hannah's dad. And um, that's why she's all there on her own and why the cabin's all boarded up and protected. And we actually like hear the, the roars of the monster. We get some point of view shots from the forest. And uh, this is something that later on in the episode is revealed to actually be uh, uh, misleading. And on the one hand, I think it's a quite a well-executed twist and subversion of your expectations. On the other hand, I, I can't really fault the episode for this because it's not its fault, but um, I can't 
help, but have felt a little bit disappointed when that turned out not to be true, because this season has been very light on the monsters, and we haven't really had many proper alien or monster threats outside of um, Tim Shaw and the Pating. And even then, Tim Shaw was the only one that was actively trying to, you know, do some harm because the Pating was simply just eating parts of the ship and the, the character's deaths would have just been an accidental product of that. But we haven't really had a proper Dr. V monster in quite some time. I know this is something a lot of other people have had an issue with this season. I haven't really. The only time it's... The only reason it stood out to me this time was because it's what we were promised. And I think because we haven't had one for a while, the fact that it was promised to us and then not given, despite it being well executed, did make me quite disappointed. And honestly, I think it did dampen my viewing of the episode upon my first watch. Because on my second watch, I did find myself enjoying it a lot more. And I think that's because I knew what to expect from it and where it was all leading. It was just the first viewing there was that initial disappointment because we haven't had that for quite some time. And honestly, even though I haven't been having much of an issue with it, now that it's something that's been promised, that I've been tantalized with, I want to see that sometime soon. Just a classic people hiding away from a monster and the doctor has to stop it. Simple as that. In any case, of course the doctor and the companions are trying to figure out what the situation is. Something that I found kind of out of character was Ryan assumes that she's lying about a monster taking her dad away saying she made up the monster uh, because he thinks that her dad just left her there which I mean somewhat makes sense considering his own dad left him but it feels out of character by this point in the season because he's seen you know different monsters and aliens and threats so he has no reason to not believe that there's a monster. He ultimately is right, but I just don't see any sort of motivation for him to actually dismiss that there's actually a monster involved because of all he's been through with the doctor. So I just thought that just was kind of jarring for me because it just didn't sit right. I think the reason that this is included is to try and aid the character work and his relationship growing with Hannah throughout the episode because they start out not really liking each other and by the end of the episode they do kind of like care for each other a little bit but um no i don't know it just it seems so out of place now our first major turning point in this episode where things aren't quite as straightforward as they seem is uh they've gotten back to the cabin and trying to you know hide from this monster and try and figure out what to do graham's investigating upstairs and he notices there's a mirror up there that doesn't contain his reflection and he goes to like touch it and it kind of like you know, it, it seems kind of like a portal or something. The doctor appears and realizes, yeah, it's, it's a portal to somewhere. And so, of course, um, she decides they have to investigate it. So she takes Graham and Yaz with her and leaves Ryan behind with Hannah. But first, uh, she draws a map on the wall of the house uh, with its most vulnerable points. This, to me, felt like a very 12th Doctor thing to do because she didn't actually draw a map. She's taking advantage of Hannah's blindness and actually wrote down some instructions. First thing, assume her dad is dead. Which really doesn't seem like it fits too much with 13's more optimistic attitude, um, but I, I think I can buy it. it. It makes sense. If he's been missing for four days and presumably a creature has taken him, that, that does make logical sense. The second one was, I, th I think it was to pr keep her safe from the monster or something like that. And then the third one was find out who could take care of her. But the, it just felt very 12th Doctor to me to keep something like that a secret from her um, and intentionally mislead her like that. And I think that's interesting seeing because um, she's been mostly acting more like 10 and 11 a lot of the time, I think. But this felt like a very 12th Doctor thing to do. So it's interesting to see the other incarnations bleeding through. And this is something that I have difficulty imagining Smith's Doctor doing, or even Tennant's. But anyways, uh, Graham, Yaz, and the Doctor go through the portal, and they find themselves in the Anti-Zone. This is a segment of the episode that's a relatively enjoyable, but ultimately pointless. It has no effect on anything. 
Uh, the Anti-Zone is treated as kind of like a maze, and there's this character, Ribbons, um, who's a really fun and entertaining character, but he's really just filler for the episode, because he, his purpose, his seeming purpose, is to guide the Doctor and her companions through the Anti-Zone, but for one thing, he dies before he can finish doing that from these flesh moths that, again, are kind of like a neat concept, but aren't really utilized to the plot's benefit. So he dies before he can fulfill that goal, and they end up getting to the other end of the anti-zone without his help. And then, later on, which emphasizes the point of his uselessness, Hannah and Ryan enter the anti-zone, and they're able to find their way to the other side without any help whatsoever. Keep in mind, Hannah makes most of this journey on her own without Ryan, and she's blind. So, what? Like, that's just so useless. And then they all find their way back to the other side of the portal, back to the original cabin, um, without any sort of help. So, uh, this whole segment, I'm not sure how long it takes up, maybe 10, 15 minutes? It's, it's a shame, because it's fun, I guess, but... It doesn't really serve any purpose in the episode, which leaves it just kind of awkwardly being there. Anyways, it's at this point in the episode uh, where the monster is actually outed to be a fake. Ryan discovers that it, the, the noises that the monster's been making is actually coming from a speaker outside uh, that Hannah's dad had set up. And he um, goes in to tell Hannah, but she knocks him out because she, he wouldn't let her go through the portal because of course it's dangerous, and that, that's what leads to both of them going through the portal. And I do just want to point out again, even though I didn't like um, at first that this expectation was subverted, it is quite well executed. It's something that makes logical sense uh, with the plot and the characters within the episode, and it's not really easy to predict, but again, it makes sense, and that, that's how you do a good twist. Something that's not easy to predict, but makes perfect sense in the context of the story. So it, it did work very well, and it, it definitely made me... I, I was definitely really surprised when that happened. Anyways, meanwhile, uh, the Doctor and Co. have reached the other side of the portal, and they come out seemingly into the cabin, but it's a little bit different. As it turns out, this is some sort of alternate reality-ish. Not all as it seems on the surface. Now this immediately piqued my interest because it's not too often the Doctor who goes to parallel universes. Um, you know, you go to all sorts of alien planets across the universe, backwards and forwards in time, but parallel universes are largely untouched. I can only really think of a few examples off the top of my head. Um, there's Inferno, of course, from 1970. There's uh, Rise of the Cybermen and the Age of Steel from 2006. There's the Pocket Universe and the Doctor's Wife from 2011. And there are definitely a couple of others. Um, I guess you could say maybe the Land of Fiction counts in the Mind Robber from uh, 1968. But I, I don't even know if that really counts as an alternate universe. It's not really. It's, it's something else entirely. But it's, yeah, it's, it's not really explored too often. So this really piqued my interest. On the side of the portal, they find Eric and his wife, who has been dead for quite some time, uh, Hannah's mother, and this is where things really start to get interesting, and then the entire thing has taken a complete shift from your traditional monster of the week to this interesting monster in the caves kind of thing, I don't even know how to describe it, to uh, it's now starting to become more psychological, and not monster-oriented whatsoever. They mention about the Dr. Graham and Yaz's friend who arrived at the same time they did. At first, I didn't have any idea what they were referring to, like, what, what friend could that mean? But then we see a shot of some, uh, some bed sheets or clothes or something hanging from a clothesline, and behind it, you can, you can see a figure, and immediately, I realized, if Eric's wife is in this place, back from the dead. Oh my goodness. That's great. And by this point in the episode, I was kind of like relaxing on the couch, you know, just kind of chilling, casually watching. As soon as I realized that was Grace, I immediately 
just sat straight up and my mouth was open and I was just like, oh my goodness. Wow. Because, I mean, here's the thing. Before series 11 aired, we were told Grace was going to be a recurring character. And of course she died in the first episode of the series. Uh, she made some cameos in Arachnids in the UK, just as visions in Graham's head. But if I'm honest, I just I didn't expect to see her again. And this, this is how you do it after a character has died. Say what you will about Chibnall, but I'm really happy with how he's handled death in this series of significant characters, because Mothra would always just bring them back from the dead. I'm still really hoping that Chibnall doesn't do this in the finale. But this is how you handle a dead character and bring them back. You do something like this that actually makes sense for why the character could be brought back, while at the same time they're not really brought back, so it doesn't cheapen their death. This creates a very interesting struggle, as Graham is struggling with his emotions after having coped with her death, but now she's back here, but she can't be her, but what if she is? And Bradley Walsh just gives a stunning performance. His emotion is so, so good. He truly is the absolute highlight of this series, and I just, I truly felt the struggle that he was going through. He, he realizes it can't be her, but he, you know, it, she's here in front of him. And of course he questions her, saying like the real Grace would know this. He pulls out like a, a necklace that he had around his neck, like what, what does this mean? What is this from? The real Grace would know this. And she knows. And the doctor knows, realizes whatever's going on here is not good. So she tells Graham that they have to go, but he doesn't want to because he's got Grace back. The best thing that's ever happened in his life. And this struggle just feels so real and genuine. It's awesome. But yeah, as I mentioned, the doctor knew this is trouble for sure. And she realizes that this is something called the Sola Tract, uh, which was something that she was told about as a child on Gallifrey. Um, the Sola Tract was something that at the beginning of our universe existed, but it kind of prevented any of the pieces from fitting together, from the, it prevented this universe from functioning. And so it got ejected into its own universe. And this is the Sola Tract, because it wants to be together with our universe, but it simply can't, and it's just trying to. And it's taken on the forms of these loved ones to try and lure, um, you know, people from our universe into its universe, to be with it. But the fact of the matter is that simply can't happen, and it causes it to, this universe to start to collapse, because they are literally incompatible with each other. Gradually though, as people like uh, Yaz and the Doctor, you know, they start reje they, they're rejecting this universe and refusing to believe it's true, Hannah's able to come through the portal and she recognizes that it can't be real, and so the Solar Tract actually ejects Hannah and Yaz from this universe back into the anti-zone, and the Doctor's trying to convince Graham of what to do. Ryan, meanwhile, has been trapped in the anti-zone and is in danger of being eaten by those flesh moths, and Grace, of course, is trying to convince uh, Graham to stay and saying that Ryan can handle himself. And that's the thing that sets it in stone for him that she's not real. And the way Bradley Walsh delivers this is just so heart-wrenching. So close. You were so close. See, Grace would never let me leave Ryan in danger. You're a fake. It's just beautiful. And so he gets ejected too. And eventually, Eric refuses to let go of his wife. But the doctor says that the solid track doesn't want a husband. It wants to experience the universe. And she has experienced the universe and can share that experience with it. So the Solid Tract ejects Eric because it knows that it can't handle that much from our universe because it's, it's literally falling apart. And the Doctor makes this sacrifice, potentially being cut off from our universe forever, just to save the Solid Tract and to save those people, cutting herself off. We're brought to an interesting sequence here. Um, obviously, the Doctor knows, you know, what's going on. The gig is up, so the solid tracks removes the facade, and we're in this like white, kind of voidy 
area. And at this point, I, I wasn't sure if we were going to start seeing things from the Doctor's past. I kind of honestly partly expected to see uh, some of the previous Doctors in some shape or form as, I don't know, the Doctor starts like thinking of these memories or sharing it with Solitract. Uh, we didn't end up seeing any of that. Ultimately, I think that was for the better. Another thing that had crossed my mind was what if there's like an old companion or something, maybe Susan, um, that the Solitract takes its form. But ultimately, I think what the episode did was the best choice for it. And what it did is, uh, well, it was absolutely ridiculous and absolutely shocking. And I, well, upon first watching it, I didn't like it. I just thought it was too absurd. Upon second watching, it's just got this really great Doctor Who kind of charm to it that actually, it works really well. As much as I can't take it properly seriously, you're not supposed to. And as much as it just doesn't feel right, it just works. I don't know how, but it it just works. And the solid track has taken the form of a frog with Grace's voice, because Grace likes frogs. And that's how it communicates with the Doctor, as the Doctor's telling it about our universe and expressing its beauty and saying how she might have just said goodbye to it forever. And it's just a beautiful scene as you have this lonely universe just seeking for a friend and the Doctor offers to be that friend. But she ultimately can't stay because even her, it's too much. Too much incompatibility. And so she tells the solid track that it has to just continue being brilliant by itself. And she gets ejected. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's the resolution to that. That, it's very character and emotionally driven. Which you wouldn't expect from where the episode started out. And I, while I have some of my issues along the way, honestly, the, the emotion in this episode is so strong and so well done. And I think upon first watch, I just, I was too distracted by thinking about what could have been and being too focused on the absurdity and subversion of it all. But on second watch, even though I started out with the same kind of mindset, gradually it started to hit home that some of those emotional scenes those character-driven scenes are really some top-tier stuff. And just speaking about it, it, it is really good stuff. And honestly, if the whole episode was of that quality, this would be an incredible episode. Yeah, I, I don't know, it's just all that stuff in the solid track. That it's just such good stuff. But anyway, everything's all wrapped up. Eric and Hannah are back together. The TARDIS team is getting ready to go. Ryan um, was told that uh, Graham saw Grace in there, and so he has a little talk with him. And this was yet another moment this episode that I perked up at. And even on a rewatch, Ryan calls Graham Granddad for the first time this series. And it just put the biggest smile on my face. I loved that moment. I've been loving watching these these characters just grow closer together in their relationship together. It started out kind of distant and strained, but through their adventures with the Doctor, they're just getting closer and becoming more like family, and it's been so wonderful to watch. And him calling him Granddad is just... It's just a perfect moment. I literally could not help myself. But to have the biggest grin on my face, even on rewatch when that happened. Yeah, that's... That's It Takes You Away. A very different kind of episode than might be expected. Subverts a lot of your expectations. Caught my attention numerous times after I had been like sucked into the episode. It just made me sit straight up and be like, whoa, what? And it's got its flaws. It does. And unfortunately, those flaws do have to drag it down. Um, like... Ribbons, the whole time spent in the anti-zone, really. And 
just the, the, the disconnect between, you know, these different kinds of episodes, although for the most part it's done pretty well. And just the, the, the general quality of everything before they get into the solo track and the emotion starts coming isn't that high. It's still good, but it's not great. But initially, after I first watched it, this was near the bottom of my ranking for the series, but after second watch, it's pretty close to the top. Yeah, I'm giving this episode an 8 out of 10 because I thought it was... it was great. The emotion was utterly fantastic. And I definitely appreciated it a lot more on rewatch. But, uh, yeah, that's... it takes you away. Ninth episode of the series, penultimate episode, next week's the finale already goes by so quick. But um, yeah, uh, that's my thoughts and opinions on It Takes You Away. Please let me know what your thoughts and opinions are down in the comments below. And I'll see you guys next week with the Series 11 finale, The Battle of Ramscore at Colors.